the university, why? God, it almost didn't come out. It's like my mind went through three or four organizations. What am I executive director of? Um, for the last month. Um, but was here when the healthcare consumers got started and also came out of the university. So that was 77. It's like, so 32 years ago this semester. It was the spring semester of 77. Um, and uh, but I, so that's, and I've been doing lots of stuff. I mean, I, you know, you don't really care about that, so I'll go back into the history. Um, so 1977, I was a student in urban planning, and um, the organization actually got started out of a class. There was a professor, Barry Checkaway, who had just come here, and he was, had a focus on how you get people involved. You know, so urban planners do this thing where they're planning for the rest of society, but they make real key decisions about who benefits and who loses kinds of stuff. You know, like when you build a highway, whose neighborhood's going to get torn down, who's going to have the exits close to their house so it's convenient for them. And so, you know, urban planners for years were famous for building highways through poor neighborhoods and having getting the people out in the suburbs come into the city and avoid those poor neighborhoods. So one of the issues that comes out of that in urban planning is, well, you know, you're supposed to come up with the best plan for everyone. And inevitably, the people who have power and influence and own the land and all the other things have input into the decision-making process. So what obligation does the planner have to make sure that everyone's voices is heard? So what about those people in those poor neighborhoods? Uh, and so all of a sudden it's like, well, do you have a hearing? Does that really work? And it really leads to the idea that, well, they need to have more resources. They, there needs to be organizing going on. They don't have influence of money, but they have influence of numbers. So do you have an obligation to do that? And then it gets into a big thing about where a lot of planners say, no, that's not my job. I just you know, do it. But then there's a need for that. And so Barry was very much into citizen participation as it went in the planning process. And um, so one of the things he did in his class, it was a workshop, was to invite people into the class to learn about issues in the community. And then we were all going to produce a report. We were going to be their clients. And this is for community people. What do you need to know? And one group looked at um, redlining in terms of banks not making loans in poor neighborhoods. And the group that I was in uh, was looking at health planning and how do health decisions get made. Um, my particular interest in picking that group was that my wife, who wasn't my wife back then, but Loretta, uh, you know, we were both students here. Uh, she didn't have insurance, uh, had pains. We thought she might have appendicitis and didn't think, God, we can't go to the hospital. What's that going to mean? So we had this panic moment, ended up being nothing. But that just all of a sudden for me was like, oh my God, what would it be like? I mean, I grew up in a middle class family. Health insurance was never an issue. Now, what would it be like if suddenly you felt like you needed health care and you couldn't get it? So that made me really curious about health care as an issue, and that's how I got involved in that group. The study was... Um, we invited all these people in. John Peterson, who's now a doctor, he was on the Urbana City Council back then. He had been elected as a socialist to the Urbana City Council uh, in 73, switched to the Democratic Party in uh, 77. Um, but so, you know, there's sort of these lefties people, and they were talking about how the federal government had set up this planning process throughout the country. There were health systems agencies, there were 205 in the country, they were funded by the federal government. And in this area, it was 16 counties, so it was, you know, East Central Illinois. And um, they got funding to make plans. How should hospitals grow? Should they not grow? Who should get the resources? Where should mental health funding go? You know, all the kinds of sort of plans that you needed for. Um, making a better, more efficient healthcare system. I think they were scared back then because healthcare costs for the country were something like $250 billion and we're going to go up to $600 billion and everyone was freaking out. I forget what it is now, but I think that was 20 years ago. Um, so uh, these plans were to be made, the agencies were set up, and there was this little thing in the law that said, you know, and they have to be representative of the community, the boards that sit on them, and they have to have consumer involvement in it. And so that gets to that question as well, what's legitimate involvement? And the, we, as a class, you know, people talked about different issues and they said, you know, we really should look at this because they have so much power about where all the resources in our community and healthcare are going. And I'm not sure that that board is very representative. So our study was looking at, and I don't even know if it's around here somewhere, this little, you know, it's typed on a typewriter kind of thing. Uh, and it was citizen participation in the East Central Illinois HSA, something like that. And we just examined who goes to the meetings, how many people elected, who's representative. And the, and the requirements like the board had at least be a majority consumers, not providers, doctors, nurses, mental health providers. They had to be a minority. So consumers had to be a majority. And then they had to be broad, broadly representative of the community. You know, the, you know, if there was a rural area, it had to be farmers and rural people, African Americans a certain percentage, half men, half women. It was very sort of affirmative actionist about what the f uh, 
representation of the consumer should be. So our study just looked at it and found out that they didn't really have the hearings, no one spoke at them. The consumers were like the bankers and the doctor's wives, and I mean, it was just, and there weren't really any consumers on there. Um, and so uh, we did this report and we presented it to the people in the uh, community who had told us about it, people from Francis Nelson and uh, other folks. And one of the recommendations was, you know, this board ought to be cleaned up, the federal government ought to stop funding, it ought to enforce the requirements until they do this, uh, they shouldn't have any power, and so, so forth. But one of the last ones was, and there should be consumers should get organized and have a consumer group to represent their voices because the doctors have their group, the nurses have their group, the hospital administrators over here, health, mental health providers, but who's representing consumers? There is no group. They're sort of dispersed and don't have any voice. Um, so that was the report. Um, the redlining report had a similar kind of finding you can imagine, and um, People got their grades and it was like, okay, you know, next class. And some of us felt like, well, heck, I didn't do all this just to get a grade. I mean, my God, you know, you sort of believe in this report. It says all this stuff, you should do this stuff. So uh, with Barry Checkaway, myself, and there were a few other people who said, well, we should follow up on that final recommendation for getting consumer group uh, started up and let's do it. And so we just started meeting and that's how it started. And literally it was a handful of people meeting in each other's living rooms. This is in 77, so May. We went to the, health, the regional health planning committee and said, oh, you should cut off funding and it's no good. And cameras showed up. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? This is kind of weird. Um, but, um, and so there's sort of this attention. We're very critical of it. Um, and then we started having forms of, you know, on alternative births. Um, you know, uh, can you afford to be sick was one of them. There was a series of forms where people would come out and there'd be panelists and stuff. But one of the things was that this local board here had an election every year to elect consumers to it. And, you know, when we looked at the history of it, there were like 20 people voted, mm -hmm. you know, out of, I think it was for Champaign, and it was a sub-region, so it was Champaign and Fort County. So it's like 150,000 people and 20 people are voting. And um, so they had their annual meeting up at the top of uh, Century 21, the, used to be the tall, we called it the garbage can in the sky back then, the big round rusted thing. Um, and there's the fanciest restaurant in Champaign-Urbana was back, back then was up on the top floor and looked over the landscape of the city. Um, so they had their annual meeting there every year. So we just thought, well, let's go and, you know, and the rules were, you had to say, I live here and I can vote. So that night, 300 and 350 people show up. Oh. So front page of the News Gazette, the restaurant was just packed full. <laughs> people are in the lobby. I mean, they couldn't seat these people. You know, the restaurant probably sat 100 people. And then down, there was elevators, so there's 21 floors, down in the lobby, completely filled lobby, just people just everywhere. And these are people who you brought? We just turned out consumers and said, you know, come out and you've got to vote and vote for this thing Private just from media yeah so I didn't really yeah so we were well we were very specific going out and talking to people you know I had Julie and Rappaport for a class so I go up to them after speaking and say you know after the lecture in class say you've got to come to this thing we're doing this stuff so anyone and everyone we could talk to you've got to come out and we probably plugged in you know those are there were networks that already exist in the community of liberal people and we just started talking to them and so it was just a huge turnout though um, and you know and it's, it's funny I hear this now the fire marshal showed up and said, you have to shut down the meeting, you can't have the election, there's too many people here, this is unsafe, if there was ever a fire in this building, we'd be in big trouble. So it was headlines of the paper, and there's this consumer group who's like, my God, what is this all about? You know, we used to have a nice little dinner and have our election, and now all these people. And I think that year there were 13 seats, and you know, and they were literally, you had ballots, and you're just, here, pass my ballot up. There was no controls, it was chaos. Now, I think of the 13 seats, seven were endorsed by the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers, and got elected in 77. So then there's sort of like, oh, who are these people? Um, you know, the hospital ministers, you know, oh God, they used to just sort of fly by night. These are the students, you know, it's, you know they have nothing to do with the community. So 1978, they were going to like, we're going to do this right. We're going to have, we're going to be prepared for that. So they set up rules and it was, you had to register to vote in the HSA election by August 15th. So before the students came into town, mm -hmm. they had this whole plan about, you know, it was happened in September and they have this whole plan about how we're going to do it. You have to show identification. It was just weird. But we took the challenge up so that 
um, uh, summer we were gathering, and I mean, God, I just remember just going around getting millions of people to sign millions. Uh, yeah. And we signed up like something like 1,500 people and wow. deliver them all the last day that they were due, like August 14th. Uh-huh. We had a stack of applications. It was great. It was in the lobby of that building because their offices were there. And, you know, we turned in all these applications. The election was held a month later, and we sw- swept all 13 seats. So there were 13 up. There were 30 on the board, and so there were 10 every year plus any vacancy. So the First year there were 13, we won 7 and 13. Second year there were 13, we won all 13. Wow. And this is when they thought they had set the rules so it would be impossible to get those troublemakers out of here. Uh, and it was sort of like we took control of this thing. Wow. It's like, wow, this is kind of cool and fun. Um, but there was also other stuff that was starting to go on. So now we're in control of the local health planning board. And, you know, the people, all of our leaders have got elected and they're getting stacks of documents like this. I mean, just crap that's really... We've, I've learned since I'm pretty irrelevant to how healthcare is delivered in the community, but you know, there's all this planning stuff, and the staff, you know, the planners are generating all this paper, and people are trying to read this, and now there's diversity on the board, there's uh, all kinds of consumers of all different income levels, different races. I mean, it's just a you know totally different uh, agency. But all of our leaders were now sort of bogged down in all this crap. The other thing was that we were starting to realize, you know, I go to meetings, and we're still meeting in each other's living rooms, and it's sort of like look around the room and it's like, God, everyone here is kind of upper middle class, pretty well off, none of them really worry about health insurance, uh, really good people, but I you know, didn't really get involved to do this. And it was like, and everyone there was very concerned. Well, where are the African Americans? Where are the other people in the community? Why aren't they in the room? We care about them. We want to get those voices on the board so their concerns are met. And um, some of us felt like, you know, well, what the hell do they care who's serving on the health planning board? I mean, if you can't get into the hospital emergency room, what do you care who's sitting on the board of something? That's not going to get you a doctor. If, you can't, if you're on Medicaid, you can't get in. So we're kind of like thinking, because we're fighting for representation for all these people, they should all be very concerned about it. But the truth of the matter is, in their lives, it had nothing to do with it. Um, and so who cared about representation were sort of, you know, academic types, university types, people who are interested in sort of democracy working and health planning working. Um, so right about that time in 78, 79, someone started saying, well, let's talk to other people. <laughs> at the time, I was working at Francis Nelson and had heard stories of Medicaid recipients who were being billed by Mercy Hospital. And um, you know, I'd be sitting there and it was, you know, we're in the attic of this little house up on Carver Street. Uh, and it's still a free clinic and people can come in and get care and it's, you know, all the furniture sort of ruffled and uh, falling apart. But this public aid worker's there and she's just expressing her frustration and she's saying, you know, this is another day where I have to spend over at Mercy Hospital saying, you, you know, there's Medicaid bills, they keep sending bills to these Medicaid recipients. Because they're on Medicaid, they don't have to pay it, but my clients keep getting these bills and I have to spend a day over there fighting it and I take it to my boss at the public aid office and he says, what do I care? If they have money to pay it, well then they probably should be paying it, you know. I mean, I'm not going to worry about that. And so this caseworker is just sort of complaining about it and uh, then there was a legal aid attorney there and said, I know we have the same thing and we get a client, we have to go over there and fight it. But no one was saying, well, let's end the policy. So we started talking to people, you know, well, who are some of the clients? And so we started having meetings about, you know, this problem of double billing of Medicaid recipients by Mercy Hospital. Um, So that started happening, right? Now, I'm going to jump, this is multitasking here. This other storyline is, so we have a group of sort of, you know, upper middle income people worried about the election of the HSA. Am I going fast enough? That's fine. <laughs> so that really, little, I usually start when I talk to say, you know, I pick up speed. It's like going downhill. <laughs> so you should feel free to ask me a question. It serves as a speed bump. You know, Mike's got to stop. Someone else talks. I catch my breath. Um, the only thing that I was going to say is we're <laughs> Slow relevant. down. No, no. We're re- I think we're keeping up, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I think we're not asking questions just because we're listening. <laughs> keeping up. But I think we're relevant. Um, feel free to, you know name names mm. um, because some some folks are still around this is yeah. it, this is internal so okay. you know but feel free to name names like I know where you're going with the story but. yeah well you know so I I will start doing I'll throw in names as I think of them so that sounds can I ask good. a quick question do yeah. you have the hotline from the very beginning you said no, you've been here no hotline yet coming yet 
So how were you hearing about clients? Well, I was, in terms of Medicaid recipients, mm -hmm. I was working at Francis Nelson. Oh, I was a grant writer, so I'm up in the attic with Tom Brown and the gang, and you know, it was a very informal place, and so people, caseworker might be out there doing something, come up and say hi, and they'd just be sort of shooting the bowl a little bit. Francis Nelson used to be really cool and had this sort of very grassroots, beautiful history. Yeah, Francis Nelson was, you know, no, we won't go into it, but it was started by the community and it was in a house that was abandoned by uh, Francis Nelson who took in the African American um, uh, orphans when they couldn't go to Cunningham Children's Home. And so that lay vacant for there for years and when Burnham wasn't taking uh, people from the African American community and people weren't getting care, uh, couldn't get into doctor's offices, they just volunteer set up out at her house, uh, Oral Mitchell and Mrs. Mitchell. Uh, um, Devoted, you know, they come home from work and they go out there and they start fixing this place up to have it. So it was a free clinic uh, that was started in 68. When I was there, it was 77 to 79, and we were, I got hired as a student intern, student interns, student interns, right? <laughs> People know that. Um, to work on getting the area designated for critical health manpower shortage area and to get funding for the first fully paid doctors at Francis Nelson. Um, so anyway, it was just sort of there. I mean, it was more by chance, you know. the the. In some ways, the organizing was going on on the HSA stuff. But we started meeting, talking to people, had a couple of small meetings of people about it. Um, but I'm going to flip back to that story. So the HSA election, so now 1978, we take over the HSA. Part of this is the lessons of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. They took, you know, when they saw us coming, we're going to make these rules, you have to sign up by the state, you know, anything to sort of cut down on participation so that they could win. We, of course, get in and say, let's open it up to the community. You know, we got rid of the, you know, you could show up that night, show that you live there, register, and then vote that night. So we're going to have this, it's democracy, let's publicize that we're in control, we want all this stuff. So the election of 79 uh, comes along for the HSA. And uh, the consumers have opened up the process. Everyone's encouraged to participate. I think the year before when we won, we won by like two to one. I think we had like 700 votes and they had 300 wow. votes, something like that. I mean, it was just like, you know, from 350 the first year to now over 1,000 people, two to one for the healthcare consumer slate. Um, Oh God, I just remembered a story. So in the third year, 3,300 people come out and vote in this little old HSA election. It's like unbelievable. We lose two to one. 2,200 for the hospitals and doctors, 1,100 for the consumers. So we, we figured if we get over 1,000 votes this year, we're going to win. And we worked hard. We had rented a bus. We were driving around the neighborhoods. Come on, you can go vote. I mean, we're doing, well, not to be outdone. Uh, the hospitals just totally turned off the hospitals. They had buses, and they would have skeletal staffs go on each floor of the hospital. Okay, we just need five people. Everyone else, down in the bus, go vote, come back. Next floor, down in the bus, go <laughs> Oh, we were blown away. And we, I think we had like seven or eight polling places. It wasn't just one. We had this, we did a great job opening up democracy. Democracy worked. We lost. Um, <laughs> so now they, they win. Uh, and this is September of 79. And there's a sort of like, oh my God. Uh, Barry Checkaway, who's a professor, wrote this article called The Empire Strikes Back in his journal about how, you know, the, the citizens are fighting it. Because right when Star Wars was coming out. So it was a big story. Um, so. Anyway, we lost control of the HSA that year, but it's been so politicized. And I remember, that was the first time I met Lou Henson. Lou Henson standing in line. And I'm thinking, wow, we got Lou Henson out, but he was with the doctors. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder to cheer for the Illini basketball team after that. Um, so, uh, so we lost the election. But as was going on in this other thing over here was this idea that, you know, this isn't everything. I mean, really, people were getting burned out going to go to these meetings every month. They'd have subcommittee meetings. They're literally going through dry planning documents, hundreds of pages of paper. And like, people are like, oh, oh, God, I hate this stuff. I can't come to the meeting. I've got to go to an HSA meeting. It's like, where's everyone at? Um, so there was sort of a good thing that was going on there. On the Medicaid front, um, so this was, it happened in 79, so uh, I think it was like the, in May, it's probably May, July, um, we decided that we should have a meeting with, we, we had up one of our community forums, it was one of the things we did, we have these forums and try and get people to come out. So we set up a forum, it was about billing, and we had invited the president of Mercy Hospital to come and he agreed to come and talk to us about it. This was, it was a little less than... Um, Sort of new to organizing. But so then a few days before, it was like a Monday night was the forum was going to be. So on a Saturday, we, call, we had contact with Mr. Aldridge the week before and said, you know, we, as we've been working on this forum, we started hearing complaints about Mercy Hospital and your double billing Medicaid recipients. And 
some people in the community would like to meet with you. And he um, agreed to meet. You know, so we had been around. He was an administrator and, you know, the, you know, it was, although tense over the elections, it was also respectful, very civic, you know. Um, and so he agreed to meet. And then he gets, uh, that Saturday morning, it was a rainy day, we, were, we had a news conference. We sort of blindsided him, I would say, in retrospect now. A news conference announcing we found out about this stuff and we're heading over to meet with the head of the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> so I say we were new to organizing. Now I give them a chance to meet, you know, and they blow you off, and then you can have the news conference, and then they'll meet right. with you. But at that time, we were afraid we missed the moment. Yeah. Um, so we had this new, he heard about it, so I'm not going to meet. And we said, you know, all these people are coming over, you know, you should meet. And he says, well, I'll meet, but no media can come in. I mean, it's okay. And we actually have pictures of this meeting. So it's a meeting at Mercy House. So we have a little news conference. We say we have these, here's examples of the bills. You know, it has a Medicaid recipient, and how much Medicaid paid, and how much the patient owes. I mean, it's clearly blatantly uh, illegal. We go over and meet with Mr. Aldrich. It's a room bigger than this, but not much bigger than this. And there's, it's packed full with people. There's about 75 or 80 people in there. All the chairs are full, and people are sort of sitting around the back. And Mr. Aldrich is sitting up front. And um, I don't know. I don't know if there might have been a couple of nuns at that meeting. I'm not sure if there were or not. But so we're sitting there, and uh, you know, we had this all very planned out. And you know, I was the very uh, rambunctious young organizer with the ponytail. And so I had identified who my leaders were going to be and what role they were going to play. And I was thinking it through. And Helen Smith, she'll be great and everything. And, and so then the meeting begins. And, and Barry Chekaway's there. And um, we start having this dialogue with Mr. Aldrich. And you know, people start saying things. And, you know, all, and he says this story where he, I always remember this. So he's sitting there. And you can see it in the picture. He's sitting up front. And there's all these people sitting there. And there's a crucifix right over his head on the wall. And as people are saying stuff, and people are kind of pissed, you know. And some people are standing up and pointing their fingers at him and in his face a little bit. And he says, you know, we run this hospital as if he ran this hospital. And I can't believe that he would do what you're saying. I mean, he would never do what you're saying is being done. I can't believe that we as a hospital would be doing what you're saying. But he agreed to look into the issue and report back. But also during this meeting, there was this sense of, you know, um, these are Medicaid recipients who see this guy drive through their neighborhood in the Mercedes and pull into the you know reserve space and go up to his office and uh, and they don't get to talk to him and they have to call up their social worker at public aid and say I got this bill or they have to call up the legal aid attorney and say I got this bill and they have to spend time fighting it and the hospital fix it. So now here's the guy in charge sitting right in front of you. So there's a bit of anger and frustration that came out at the uh, at Mr. Aldrich um, and I you know I don't how many people knew Mamie Smith. I think only Paula. And everybody's wow. seen pictures of her. It's a lady, uh, African American lady, but. Um Oh, she's in. Oh, uh, there's Louise. I think she's in that one. I'm not sure. She's Mamie was. Mamie was my the leader. I had sort of identified who I thought would be really good was Helen Smith, and uh, so Helen came and I met with her before the meeting. We we're going through all this stuff, but Helen was kind of intimidated by the whole situation. She was very quiet and sort of sitting there and not saying stuff. And we had made this little chart of our demands. You know, stop the billing, uh, give everyone a notice who's on Medicaid that they don't have to pay it if they mistakenly get a bill, pay back anyone who's paid the bill, and then we also had things like, I think, affirmative action because they were going to construction working plan, put low income people on your board of directors. I mean, we had this nice little chart and check off boxes and it's very sweet. And um, they're like, well, someone's got to ask those questions and, you know, look at Helen and she's like, oh God, I don't know. Really. And so all of a sudden, and I didn't know who she was at the time, this woman, older woman, stands up and it ends up being Helen's mom, Mamie Smith. And she takes the poster and she goes down the list with Mr. Aldrich. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're gonna, no, to all of them. You're going to do this. No, you're going to do this. No. And, I'm, and that's, you know, he gives this little speech. And, you know, I must say, so as an organizer, I'm thinking I can pick out my leaders and body leaders emerge. And Mamie, you know, until she passed away, was a, a cornerstone of the organization. So she was here for 25, 30 years. Like um, the I mean, matriarch of the organization. To us, really. yeah, yeah. So, um, the meeting happens two nights later. Oh, uh, yes, well, the Sunday's newspaper is Consumer Group's Tactics Question. Page three, bottom of the News Gazette, and page three. I, mean, I always remember the headline. Thinking, that's what the story's about, our tactics. This hospital's doing something illegal, and it's our tactics. It's the headline. <laughs> Figures. Yeah. So, anyway, Monday night, we have the forum. Mr. Aldwood shows up. 
and uh, there's three people, the George Bell from the public aid office, I mean from legal assistance is there talking and Mr. Aldrich is talking, I forget who the third person was. And during Mr. Aldrich's presentation he says, you know, first of all, some of you have heard we had this thing and I just want to announce to you that I've looked into the issue and Mercy Hospital was not legally billing Medicaid recipients. It was the computer. And the computers out of St. Louis that generated the bills, they were doing it, we're clean, but we're going to agree to uh, uh, hand out notices to any Medicaid recipients. We'll pay back anyone who mistakenly paid the bill. Uh, we'll, what was the third one? There's, there's three there. He agreed to do all those. Didn't agree to affirmative action or to putting low-income people on the board of the hospital. But in, in two days, he solved the problem that was affecting hundreds of people in the town, but who had to go one by one with their caseworker, with their you know public aid, I mean with the legal aid attorney, and go through this hassle. Now suddenly, with one day, it's sort of the issue gets solved, or two days. And so there's this great victory, celebration. Hospital agrees to stop doing it. I don't think any of that. Made into the paper, although they might have mentioned some of it. But um, so it was like, wow, this is great. Um, but so this is, you know, this is May of '79. So we haven't lost the election yet. We're still in control. Um, but the hospitals are resenting us to to no end. Um, we have our next meeting of the board, and the board ends up being sort of the people who are on that other track fighting the HSA uh, battles, and. Uh, the, you mean the board of directors? The board of healthcare. healthcare consumers is pretty much the people over there. So this has been sort of an organizing project to, you know, we want to address what are the real issues facing low-income people or other people in the community. What are who? You know, what's what's bothering them? So in the. Um, go back and have a meeting, and most of the people who came to the meeting were not at the hospital thing. But I remember this one person, I don't want to say a name though, but yeah. she said, um, I was at Bridge Club. Saturday night, and there was that whole story on the news about um, the meeting with Mr. Aldrich, and you know, someone said, "Well, is that isn't that that group you're involved with, the healthcare consumers?" That seemed like you know, pretty unfair to put them on the spot and the video, and I mean, it wasn't in the room, but we talked to people after. It just seems like not, you know, couldn't you have done it a better way? And she said, "So I'm here to say, can't we do this without this confrontational stuff? I mean, I'm really not comfortable with it. it you know, I, I don't want to go to Bridge Club. I, I like the healthcare consumers, but this is not what I want to do." And uh, there was a woman, Elsie Easley, who was uh, uh, here in town. She was an African-American woman, active. She was a, a nurse. She was very involved in Frances Nelson. And um, she was sort of like the John Lee Johnson, but female version. Um, so she's in, we're in Henrietta DeBoer's living room. And uh, Elsie says, well, you know what, I'm glad you weren't fighting for my civil rights because if we were all sitting around bridge worrying about offending anyone, then I wouldn't have the right to vote and just poof, really tore into the other person. And it was a very intense meeting, but you know, in some ways it was very real, but raw. And um, so we had this long discussion and sort of debate and one of the things that was very healthy about it, and so I see the healthcare consumers sort of this history of, you know, I mean, we're just folks figuring out what to do and not necessarily knowing real well in learning, but there's these great lessons. And so to me, this is one of the real lessons. The whole Mercy Medicaid thing about the healthcare consumers, I think, is important now as it was back then. But um, one of the things that happened in this debate was that, well, why did you do it that way? What, would have, what could have been this way? And so as it went on, it was sort of like, well, you know, you could have, Mike, called up Mr. Aldrich. We're well known in the queue. You could have said, we'd like to come over and meet with you and not brought all those people. And you know, you and Barry or someone could have met with him and gotten this resolved. He probably would have, you know, Mr. Aldrich suddenly looked into it. I mean, the hospital probably did not do this intentionally. It was just it wasn't important enough to anyone who could do anything about it. So the social worker in the hospital would have public aid say, oh, I'm sorry, fix it. They couldn't get it up to the Mr. Aldrich's attention. It just wasn't that important for whatever reason, you know. Um, and so, couldn't you have done it and then he would have fixed the problem? And the group concluded at the end, you know, that probably was one legitimate way of doing it and it could solve the problem. But it would have reinforced what people tend to believe, and that is you can't fight City Hall. Sure, Mike Doyle, I see him on the news, and you know, he's somebody who's somebody. He can meet with Mr. Aldrich, but I'm a Medicaid recipient. I can't meet with Mr. Aldrich. He's not going to, oh, I'm Mr. Aldrich, I'm on Medicaid, and I don't like what you're doing. Can I have a meeting? It's like, yeah, talk to the social worker. Um, and that really, this vehicle, although probably not handled as well as it could have been, um, in terms of giving him any heads up notice of what was going on, and giving him the opportunity to not do the right thing. Um, but people who were there were involved in the issue. And they felt like after two days, that changed because I went to those meetings leading up to it. I went to that meeting on Saturday. I went to the meeting on Monday. 
Now we solve the problem. What's next? And there's a sense of empowerment of that. And there's a sense of like, yeah, it does make a difference. I'll go to the next meeting because we're doing something that's real in my life. You know, I had to face this and now I'm going to do that. So there was a sense, hey, that's really how we should be doing this. We can sort of circumvent it. Next time, Mike, you know, give Mr. Aldrich a chance to fix the problem. But you should be involving people in it and giving them that sense of their power. But you have to make real differences in people's lives. So that was a very critical point of it. But it raised one of the schisms in our organization, and that was, well, gee, there's the board, and then there's these new people, and we want new people who come in, they're involved in the issue, they should have some control over it, but they're not always the same people who are on the board, and the board's disconnected, so we said, well, let's set up tasks, so there was a decision, I mean, there was a discussion at one point about, well, maybe we should create two groups, we'll have the healthcare consumer group that works about HSAs, and we'll have a consumer group of low-income people, and they'll be a separate group from this group, and the decision was, well, no, we don't want to do that, we can all be in one organization, and so the thing was that the board would be here, but we would have task forces. And whoever we have issued task forces, the board would say, we're going to have an issue area, you do it. And who's ever involved in that gets to go to the meetings, they get to make the decisions, set the strategy, uh, set the policy for it. And we as a board can't interfere with that. And so that was very important, and it was a structure that began happening where people were empowered to do what they want, the board sort of recognized, and then every task force, of course, had to be represented on the board so that they had a voice there and stuff like that. But it was sort of adjusting to the clear, uh, clear differences of values and different types of people in the organization who want to be part of the same organization, but sort of respecting, you know, Elsie's comment about, you know, I'm glad you weren't fighting for my civil rights. Well, it's like, well, so what works for this group of people, what are they comfortable with, might be different from what these other people want to do. And everyone should, whatever issue they're working on, they should feel comfortable with doing that. So at that Did point... Did you lose anybody? I, you know, I don't think so. I mean, it was, it's tended, you know, I'm, it's, so it's 30 years later. It all looks good now. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. There may have been some people who were like, I don't like this. But the key people in it, uh, you know, um, I think were, came to the conclusion that that made sense. So, I mean, it was, it was a good process to go through. And I don't remember people sort of dropping out for now. I'm going to walk away. I mean, there was another point where I think some people left out of frustration that their voices weren't being heard, but uh, not on this particular occasion. So that was sort of a, 79 was sort of this key thing, because it was sort of like HSA, and then we got, then three months later, the hospitals uh, killed us with the election. And, but it was sort of like, oh, okay, so what are we doing? And the other thing is that when the healthcare consumers started in 77, there were like healthcare consumer groups all over the country. When these HSAs got started up, sort of progressives, you know, this is back when, you know, there was talk about having a national healthcare system, as there has been forever. And and this was sort of the, seen as the first step. Well, we'll put in these planning agencies, and then we'll impose the, you know. Um, so they were seen as that. So a lot of activists were very involved around it, but they were all focusing on the HSAs. Well, Jimmy Carter loses in 79, right? Gets killed, or 80. Uh, Ronald Reagan says goodbye to HSAs, uh, and then all these groups are like, what are we going to do now? We, you know, the HSA, we, we were fighting for representation, and there were cases in courts, and the groups were meeting, you know, talking about well, what are you doing in Illinois, and what are you doing in Indianapolis, and stuff like that. But all of a sudden, all these groups started falling away. For healthcare consumers, the work on Medicaid, which then led to a campaign around Hilburton, which is the hospital OS picture there. Uh, so that was 1980-81. Uh, what does that say? Spring of 81. Um, so our stuff started going off on issues that were affecting people other than HSAs. HSAs went away. All these healthcare consumer groups just sort of disappeared. I mean, it was amazing, and like overnight. Groups were getting funded by foundations to have input into the planning process. There was a statewide group here called the Association of Healthcare Consumers, A. HCC, which actually started, uh, it was, came in two formations, but it was actually started before the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers. It later changed its name to the Illinois Center for Citizen Involvement, then Public Interest Fund of Illinois, and then Community Shares of Illinois. Um, so it had some evolution there. But um, they all sort of went away, and part of it was, well, what are you working on? The whole idea of national health care went away. Lots of things went away in Ronald Reagan's uh, first two terms or two terms. Um, but we sort of grew and became stronger because now we were starting to address issues that affected people. We were starting turning out people. Uh, and there were all kinds of different ways we were going. Let me put on my glasses here to refer to my notes. So, um, oh, my goodness, I've covered a lot of area here. Um, so we started doing, so 1980 is when the hotline started. Um, so we lose the election. We did this thing around Medicaid. We're starting to do stuff. There was a group out in Cape Cod. Um, is a guy, Wade Rathke, who's with the Service Employees Union, represented the hospital workers on Cape Cod Hospital. And I remember reading this article 
uh, I forget where I got it, Cape Cod News, I can picture it, is about how they were fighting the hospital, and it was the union hospital workers with low-income people fighting the hospital for not giving Hilburton care. And they were doing this Christmas caroling outside the hospital. And I thought, wow, that's a great thing. And they had these carols they made up and sing at the hospital. Um, so we started looking, at, well, what's Hilburton? It was money that hospitals gotten in the 40s and 50s and 60s to build. So after World War II, the, you know, all these veterans are coming back and needs all this care. The rural areas don't have hospitals. So the federal government starts funding as a step toward national health care, another effort back then, uh, to give money to hospitals to build and to build facilities to handle our veterans coming home. Um, in exchange for that, there was this little sentence that said, um, you have to give a reasonable amount of free and low-cost care when you get these funds. But hospitals were very non profit back then. They had, you know, came out of concerns for providing care in their community, um, often religious, sometimes public. Um, so that was the requirement. By the late 60s, there was, um, in early 70s, legal aid attorneys realized that this clause existed in there, and these are hospitals that are turning away people for not being able to afford care, and they'd sued, and there was this ruling that the government, uh, um, that the legal aid attorneys did against the hospitals, that the government never defined what a reasonable amount of free and low-cost care was. So in the late 70s, new regulations came out. Oh my goodness, the Christmas Carol book. Wow. <laughs> I just knew where it was. Someone else is going to have to say, I can't sing. Oh, but wow, is that cool? Um, I will come to that. So, so there's this, in 77, um, these new regulations came out in the Cutter administration that a reasonable amount of free and low-cost care meant one of two things. Either you give away 10% of your grant, so if you got a half million dollars, you have to give away $50,000 every year for 20 years, which basically doubles how much you got, but it does it over 20 years. Or you have to have an open door policy, which means that you take whatever is the need in the community and you're just committed to serving that and you don't have. So there's the two things. There was a third thing is that you had to always take Medicaid recipients. You couldn't discriminate against Medicaid. Well, so anyway, this group in Cape Cod organized around this issue. The hospitals weren't providing re free and low cost care. They weren't telling them, anyone about the program. So we started looking into it here. Uh, we did stuff like um, we went to the, this is, we, we stole all this. Wade Rathke later started a group called ACORN uh, in New Orleans. Um, so uh, he was quite a good organizer. But uh, this was early in his career. But so he, they did this thing where they went down to the courthouse and went to small claims court and started looking at who's the hospital suing. So we thought, well, that makes sense. So we took our folks and we went down there and we started just going through um, the records, looking up people who were being sued by the hospital. And there were hundreds of them. I mean, we just had, it was like a gold mine. It's like, well, I'll have to go down and see them. It's like, oh my God, they're being sued by the hospital. Carl, Mercy, Burnham, every, every hospital suing people. Uh, so then we would call people up and say, oh, you know, we noticed you're being sued by the hospital. Hospital. We wanted to let you know that there's this program the hospitals are all required to have to give free and low cost care to anyone who can't afford it. Were you told about that? No, I wasn't told about that. Well, we'll have a meeting next week of people who might not know about this program. Come down to our office and, you know, we'll tell you about the program and how it works. So people are coming out because, like, my God, they owe hundreds and thousands of dollars to hospitals and they may not have to pay anything, right? So there's nothing like a little self-interest to motivate people. So people are coming down and we're starting to build up this incredible cases. Anyway, that's a campaign that's sort of taking off. But what started happening is we, we went to the HSA, which we no longer control, and we said, we think there should be an investigation of this. Here's all these instances. Here's all this data. And they're being sued. And, you know, and the HSA is like, oh, my God. We've, you know, now they're back in control. So we're thinking, well, if you're in control now, so now you've got to be accountable. Everyone knows about this agency. It's been in the news the last three years. Consumers make this accusation. Well, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll set up a committee to look into this. And Vern Barkstall from the Urban League, who's executive director, who, you know, Vern hung around with the bankers and knew how to go in those circles. But he came out of the community, so he understood how to do that. So he was very, he was someone who sort of could go both ways. So he agreed to serve and we lined up all these people in advance to say they would be willing to serve. So we had people like John Lee Johnson, uh, Vern Barkstall, people in the community write to the thing and say, we understand that last night you voted to set up this commission. I would like to volunteer my services <laughs> to serve on that commission. <laughs> so now what are they going to say no to all these people who are distinguished community leaders? No, we don't want you on it. So they, oh, okay. so they set up a great commission and they started holding hearings and that was at the hearing there. Hospitals, oh, it's that woman who's right above it is Mary Evans, and that's her daughter sitting right next to the, her granddaughter, I mean, sitting next to the sign. Mary's husband had died, and they had gone after her, and they had to sell their home to pay the medical bills, and they didn't even pay them all. And so she lived out in the senior housing on John Street. I forget what it's called. Um, on the other side of Madison. But there were so a lot of these, just pretty, huh? Brown Barn. Brown Barn, yeah. 
and Claire Greenblatt was out there. So all these very touching stories. I mean, just sad. Most of them were older women who they ran into a lot of medical bills toward the end of their lives and their spouses or something like that. And now the house was going after them for the money and they couldn't afford it. And um, so it was very sad. So we had this hearing and these people came up and testified and it was very touching and it didn't look good for the hospitals. And so now the committee, which is in our control because all of our folks wrote letters saying they'd serve on it, is writing up this report about how this is going on. Well, in the meantime, we're doing stuff like the Christmas Carol thing. It's like, oh, the Christmas Carol. So this is, looks like the original Christmas. We, we didn't even type it like on the pages. We had to cut it out and staple it in there. <laughs> How sad. And so one is pay, pay, pay your bills. Pay, pay, pay your bills. Up and up they go. We're going to organize and let the doctors know. No, no, no. But, uh, anyway. <laughs> And then there's one, we shall overcome. Yeah. Universal health care to the tomb of old time religion. Uh, going to lay down my green card to the tune of going to lay down my sword and shield. Solidity forever. <laughs> yeah, green card. We shall not be moved. So, in, you know, Kev, I mean, Kevin is, well, this would have been later that he did. I don't know if these were his or not. Uh, so anyway, we did this singing. It was great. So all this publicity. Um, but one of the things that happened is people started hearing about us, so they started calling our office. And it was like, hi, I saw about you guys, I've got this problem. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, we're not working on that issue, you know, you should call someone else. <laughs> hi, I've got this problem, I've got this, oh, so, you know, we're, we don't really do social services, we're advocates and organizing the people, I'm sorry, we don't have time for you right now. <laughs> um, and you take a few of those phone calls and you realize, man, this is not sounding right, something's wrong here, what, what are we doing? And um, so there was a woman, Myra Glassman, um, Myra was a student of social work uh, and she was doing her internship with us 30 hours a week for a semester or two and um, Joe Costigan Joe is now with um, Act 2 and Unite he's a labor union official and Myra last time I saw her was working for Acorn in Chicago and I think they've now split off but her brother Jeff Klassman I think yeah. still is in town here yeah. yeah so Myra was our intern with Joe Costigan it was like I got all these calls coming you guys are social workers help us figure this out and so we came up with the idea of we should have a consumer health hotline. And what, what we're going to do. did you have like staff members? Like 79, we got a thing called a citizen participation grant. It was for $25,000. Uh, and it went through, because there was no one in this town who would fund us, it went through the uh, community service agency in Danville. Uh, we wrote this grant, went over to them and said, we'd like to submit this, but we're not. Can find that it was the regional planning commission. I mean, you know, at this point, anyone who had anything to do with stuff, healthcare consumers were hot. This was not common for people to be like this. I mean, they're used to the students doing. But it was like, what's going on over here? Um, so it was a grant. So '79, and I was the first staff person. I think I was three quarters time in '79, uh, nine thousand dollars a year. <laughs> it was twelve thousand annuals pay, but nine thousand for the three quarters time. Um, so that was our first staffing back then. And in '79, we also got the uh, our first offices under this grant, which was at the corner of Lincoln and Fairview, uh, where the Family Video parking lot now is. It used to be a little uh, rundown building. Oh, kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> so that was in 79. Uh, but we had student volunteers. We started getting VISTAs so, uh, right before Carter left. So we got VISTA volunteers in 79. And so then we started having four or five staff people in around 1980. So when the Hilburton stuff was going on, there were VISTA volunteers. So. And we had VISTAs. You were a VISTA when you started, right, Paul? So 20 some years, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, but we, we've set up the hotline as a way to handle the calls, but then to encourage the calls. And then we sort of came up with this idea, wow, this is sort of like our eyes and ears in the community. And over the years, if you look at the issues that we've addressed, so many of them are a result of people just calling up saying, I got this problem, and you get it four or five times. It's like, okay, sort of like that first Medicaid billing thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, people are having this problem, but no one's addressing the big issue. How do we change that? Mm -hmm. So we started doing the hotline and started doing volunteers training. Uh, Cynthia, so Myra Glassham started it. Cynthia Ward, who was a VISTA who came probably 81, eventually was executive director from 83 to 85, somewhere in there, um, really took it to a whole new level of training and the training manual, and we started recruiting lots of students to come and do that. So that was around the time that the hotline got started. So that was 1980, I think, was the first one. Um, 
But uh, so we started having different task forces. So I was looking at the history here, and there were things like so. It was part of it was like, okay, so how this works is if you address people's issues and how it affects them, they're actually likely to get involved instead of sort of this HSA planning thing that should everyone should care about because you know it says it needs women's and blacks and all different kinds of groups, but it wasn't having any relevance to their life. Um, so we started a women's health task force that uh, Barry Bork was a person who was uh, the staff person with that. Um, so this is around 81. Um, well, I'll say right. I knew that was going to happen at some point, right? Um, so this is 81. So remember my son Dan was born when I was at a uh, Loretta went into labor when I was at a women's health task force meeting talking about <laughs> DES. I get this call before cell phones. We're at someone's house. And I get this call. Come home. It's time. It's like, oh. So it was January 18th, 1981. Um, and DES was a drug given to women. People know what that is. No? Yeah. So in the 60s, DES was a drug given to women in the actual ads out of the medical journal to have a healthier baby. Well, what they didn't realize, and I don't know what DES stands for, but some long chemical name, but they found out uh, that the women who took it, their female children uh, got cervical cancer. Uh, There's a higher incidence of it. And so this drug given to these women to give them healthier babies was actually given their babies when they became young women cervical cancer. So there was a big push around this and the push was, um, you know, of course insurance companies wanted to argue pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. This goes back to when your mom took that stuff. We don't cover that. Um, and so there's a big push to ensure the insurance companies had to cover it if a girl had DES or a woman had DES. And then to do free screening in, in public health departments where women could go in and get screened if they had uh, this so they could get early treatment uh, to address it. So um, so the Women's Health Task Force around DES. They then moved on to midwifery. So it was sort of like well what other issues are out there? People would show up at meetings and they sort of raise them and, and then the group would begin working on them. Uh, we did stuff around um, uh, uh, medical records. There was a psychiatric records thing. So this is 82, um, where at Carl Clinic, you know, they were proud of being holistic healthcare providers. So when people were in there, the guy called the hotline, said, I'm sitting there talking to my doctor. He's not responding to me with any respect. Something's wrong. He leaves the room. I look at my medical record. There's all my psychiatric notes in my medical records. So this doctor is evaluating me based on what my psychiatrist is writing about me. And that's between me and my psychiatrist, not this guy. So there was this big fight over whether or not holistic providers should keep psychiatric records in a regular medical file where nurses can see it, doctors can see it, and you know. Um, and so it went to the state's Human Rights Commission and they ruled against Carl and um, I don't know if there was a law changing that, but there was a, a thing. So we had, again, sort of this diverse set of issues. One of the things that started coming up, and it came out of the seniors being involved through Hill Burton. Oh God, and Hill Burton. This is one of those things where nobody knew about this program. And we did this, I don't know, it might have been in, uh, one of the newsletters has a great chart about how many people were getting, you know, because the hospitals had to report to the federal government how many applicants for free and low cost care had applied. And the numbers in this period from like 77 to 81 or 82 just went off the charts from like 30 people a year up to 450 people a year. How much money they were giving away, because they all had an open door policy, but they never told anyone about it. So they were never giving the 10% level. Uh, now that this word was out there, it was like went off the charts. So now they're giving away three and $400,000 a year. Uh, one of the bad things was that the law said, well, if you exceed your uh, certain amount, you can deduct it from future years. Uh, and so we had the legal aid attorney saying, oh, this is bad. There's too much publicity because all these people are getting care. And they're going to use up all the free care, you know, before 1984. I and mean, you can't have that. What are we going to do? And it's like, you know, well, so, and part of organizing is that you change the rules of the game. When the rules are this thing, that's what passed in rules that went through the, you know, federal government and everyone Everyone's advocating for it, and those are the rules of the game, and who control those rules, that's why that's such a bad thing. We want to redefine that. So when we're doing all this stuff, and the hospitals are clearly not doing what they're doing, and coming to the hearings and talking, they say, well, 
you know, this is just an administrative oversight, poor record keeping. Of course, we don't really care about these rules. We just want to do it right. So, you know, don't hold us to the accountability of rules, rules, rules. We want to do is get poor people the care they need. So when all of a sudden the money's running out and they don't have to do it anymore, it's like, remember that, Mr. Aldrich? And uh, I forget who the guy, Mr. Van Voorst at Carl. And uh, you guys said you didn't care about the rules. That just gets in the way of getting poor people care. Will you sign a commitment that you always have a free care program, irregardless of your re, uh, obligations under Hilbert. And that's when the first free care program and low cost care and the hospitals sort of set these up. They agreed to stuff like taking out a full page ad in the newspaper, announcing to the community that they were doing this up because they didn't care about the rules. They just wanted to get people care. So part of it is, you know, the action's always in the reaction. You, and so that's the, you know, when we were doing the Mr. Aldridge thing, we probably jumped the gun a little bit. We should have given him a chance, say, we have an issue. Will you meet with people about it? If he would have said yes, we could have had our meeting. If said no, but we, you know, give them the chance because the action's always in the reaction. However they react, there's the way that you react to what they're doing. And you just keep playing it along, and oftentimes they give you the ammunition to do the right thing, right? So, um, so Hill Burton was really successful, but out of it, the seniors started coming to us and talking to us about Medicare. So this is around 83, 84. Um, Bob Gern was the staff person, and um, we got funding from the... Uh, Oh, now I'm going to really test my stuff. This is another crisis in the organization. So around 82, 83, when we did the Medicaid stuff, we were, got funding from the Catholic Church's Campaign for Human Development, which they have great commercials on the TV now. I think it's a little girl who's hanging onto the bar, says, I can't health care, and we're all in this together, and I like her fingers are slipping, and we all can work this out, and there's this little girl hanging there. <laughs> Campaign for Human Development, the Catholic Bishops Conference. I mean, it's a very effective commercial, but one of the things you also learn in this is that when you're pushing for change, you know, the people who you're pushing against will push back. And so we got this grant from the Campaign for Human Development to work on Hill Burton, low income issue. They fund community groups to do community organizing. Uh, we got it in 82, I think, 83. We were doing great stuff around it. The hospitals, more cares going out and everything. We were going in for a third year of getting funding. And uh, we were the highest ranked grant in their region. Uh, we we're one of the highest ranked grants at a national level. Uh, and in this diocese, very successful, held up as this is the kind of community organizing that should, we should be supporting. The bishop, um, his vicar general, who later became bishop, Bishop Myers, um, got contacted by Mercy Hospital and said, you know, we hear you guys are giving $25,000, $35,000 a year to this group called the Champaign County Healthcare because what the hell are you doing? He said, what do you mean? So says, well, this Campaign for Human Development grant is going to the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers, and they're in the newspaper criticizing our hospital. Why would we be doing that? And the Vicar General says, I can't imagine why we would be doing that. We refuse to take the grants from the National CHD Committee to come into our diocese to support that organization. And so that was about $35,000. I think our budget at that time was somewhere around $60,000. It's so like, whoa! Um, you know, time for unemployment. Um, and it just sort of devastated the organization. It happened at the last minute. We, had, we were doing fine and suddenly they pulled the rug out from under us. And so one of the lessons that taught us was, you know, if you're playing with the big boys, they're going to come and do whatever they can to cut you off at the knees. And if you're getting money from someone, that gives them control over you. So one of our commitments always was, I'd rather be getting small amounts from lots of people because then that's who I have to be accountable to. If I get money from the government, if I get money from the Catholic Church, and it's too much. I mean, I'll take it from them, but if I become dependent on that, that's going to change our behavior. So, um, so anyway, the Hill Burton campaign uh, sort of taught us this lesson about fundraising. So that's when we really started getting into doing more fundraising. Uh, how do we diversify it? How do we do that? You know, we were able to rally people's support because there's nothing like the federal, you know, the Catholic Church is cutting off funding because we're critical of the Catholic Church. Don't let that happen. Don't snuff out the voice of uh, consumers in our community. So um, it was, again, something we survived and adjusted to in the process of it. Um, I'm going to stop. People have questions? Different things? I mean, I can keep rambling, but I look up and I've been talking for an hour. I have, How boring. I have one question about at what point did the mission statement get developed? Because we said a lot of stuff that's right out of the mission statement, you know, from that early, like 1979, hmm. you know, with the tension. And so I was just wondering what it had developed. Yeah, I... Um, 
don't know specifically, but I'm guessing. I mean, so a big part of our bylaws were drafted right after that 79 thing of creating task forces and empowering them and, and that sort of stuff. So, you know, I think that really set the foundation for how we function for years after that. And I think it was, you know, part of the success of the organization was somehow thinking through the challenges and saying, well, if this is the problem, what do we want? We want people to have their voice. And so I think it, you know, it just evolved out of that. And I don't know if I have a specific date now. Um, so there were, so all this stuff started snowballing. Oh, I was going to go to the seniors because that was another cri critical thing. So um, by this time we had moved over to our offices on Neal Street above Ed Bloom's store. Um, Dragon's Horde, Dragon. downstairs, we were upstairs from that. Do you know where Carrie's is on Neal Street? It's like right thing? across from Cowboy West. Oh, yeah, yeah, sort of diagonally. Yeah, right. in the bar. Yeah, no, 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 I know what it is. Yeah. So right above. Back then, there were no bars downtown. <laughs> it was a like ghost town, and they were looking for anyone to rent office space. So. That town was yeah. entirely different. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we had moved from Urbana over to uh, Champaign. Uh, Bob Gurn was on our staff. He was a Vista, I believe, initially. Um, this was so, and it reminded me that we had the Campaign for Human Development grant. We lost that. I, I'm trying to think who gave us funding for the senior stuff. Uh, it might have been the Retirement Research Fund. It might have been them early on. But we had heard about, so seniors were coming to us and they were complaining that, you know, Medicare was great, but under President Reagan, we're having more and more of these costs being passed off to us. More and more out of pocket expenses that we can't really afford. And there was this thing back then, I don't even know if it's still around, called Medicare Assignment, where a doctor would, could do one of two things. Could say, I'll take Medicare as payment in full, but the senior still had, I think I paid 10%. It was like 90% Medicare paid 10% for the senior. But the doctor, it was a rate that was set. And the doctor could say, well, this costs 1000 But Medicare would say, well, it's only worth 700 So he would get you know, 90% of the 700 from Medicare. And he could either just take the 10% from the senior. Or he could say, no, senior, you have to take whatever I say it is above what Medicare pays. Yeah. So, but it was up to the doctor to decide, am I going to take assignment or I'm not going to take assignment. Um, it wasn't as bad for the hospitals. but um, So seniors started complaining planning about this. Up in Wisconsin, I think most of the good ideas we had were stolen from someone else, but up in Wisconsin there was a statewide senior organization that started, or in Minneapolis as it was, that was Pete Wyckoff in Minneapolis, um, that they organized. They knew right about this time in the mid-80s, you know, so during the 60s and 70s, hospitals had totally overexpanded. You know, they just, everyone wanted the latest equipment, they wanted to get bigger and better. Here in town we have four hospitals. I mean, you know, we're down to two now. There were four hospitals, everyone's in expansion plans. Suddenly, it's like we can't really afford to do this then the insurance companies and everyone's saying well we're going to shorten how much we'll pay so before it used to be Medicare used to do pay cost plus so you would say okay we have a hospital and we have a thousand patient days 45 percent of those patient days are Medicare patients so we add up all of our costs and we say to the federal government you 45 percent of the patients are yours so guess what you're going to have to pay us 45 percent of all of our costs so if we build a building 45% of it is covered by those guys. You know, if we, so it was, and plus, it was cost plus. Then they got a percentage, you know, operating bonus above their costs. So that just encouraged spend more, spend more, because we're guaranteed bigger amounts from the federal government. They'll finance this huge amount. So the federal government was saying, well, we can't afford it. Ronald Reagan was saying, we can't afford it. So they started going to different ways of doing it, because they wanted to shrink down. People were staying in the hospital for seven days a week, and it was like, you know, really? People only need the hospital when they have a baby for a day, maybe not even that. They should go home sooner. So suddenly the hospital was like, let's get these people people in and out of here. We don't need this, you know. Um, so uh, hospitals started having excess capacity. And then the hospital's like, well, who's going to get the patients? Because now we're having a hard time paying for it because we're reducing this. We've got all this excess capacity. So there became this real competition for patients. And the folks in Minneapolis, the Senior Federation on Minneapolis, came up with this idea as well, you know, the best patients, the ones that have the most money behind them that's good and guaranteed are Medicare patients. And the hospitals love Medicare patients. This was a different time. And so they would love to have, so what, why don't we just all of us seniors get together and we say, well, we're going to go to the hospital that gives us the best deal. We're going to negotiate with you. You know, we're going to, if you want us to come there, then we want you to waive out-of-pocket expenses and we want your doctors who are on staff to take Medicare assignment. And, you know, for low-income seniors, maybe even waive the 10%. 
And so the hospitals are looking at this, make or break, let's do it. So they start negotiating and they sign this agreement. And so then the Wisconsin seniors did it. And so then we thought, well, you know, I forget how we came about it, but our seniors were complaining to us. Burnham Hospital was really struggling at the time. So we started talking to seniors and seniors were like, let's get together and we can pool our resources and we'll negotiate with the hospital that gives us the best deal. And that's what Medicare 100 Plus got started. We had this meeting. Uh, so Mary Evans and Claire Greenblau and um, God, Ruth Baker, all these people who really had all these stories again about how they had financial hardship because of their hospital and medical bills came made this presentation, Sandy Jones from Burnham Hospital, all these people were there saying we need to work with you, we'll work in partnership with us and she said well I'll take it back to the administration. There's a guy Peter Goshi who is the CEO there who was sort of forward looking although you know what he was looking for it's, it's going to be hard to succeed in this environment so they signed a Medicare agreement with Burnham Hospital and it was sort of a win-win-win the hospital suddenly gets all these patients start coming in. So seniors started going to Burnham instead of Mercy and Carl. So they're getting these patients. So they're winning the market war. The seniors are now getting discounts on that whole thing. And the consumer group is negotiating this. So it was, well, you get this for our members. If, and so we signed the agreement with the hospital. If you agree that our members get this discount, you know, they'll go there. You'll get patients. But what we got was this whole recruiting tool to reach out to senior citizens in the community. So suddenly we're signing up hundreds of seniors who want to be in this program. Then we started negotiating with pharmacies. Will you give this discount on this? A big thing on the hospital was the hospitals got the patients. But really the providers who were taking the cut a little bit was the doctors, that Medicare assignment piece. But the doctors were all affiliated with a particular hospital, so they would do it out of commitment. There. Plus, it was means tested. It said, you know, this isn't for any senior, but it's for low-income seniors. If, if you're a poor person, why the doctors really, you know, you're making enough money, you don't need to make it off this low-income senior. So they would recognize that that was a legitimate thing. And then for higher-income seniors, okay, we'll give you a discount because you're going to come to our facility. Um, so it was sort of a win-win-win thing, and there's a great little, little more professional, we got a little better than this, uh, mm -hmm. manual about how you go about organizing. So it was retirement research funded. We made a manual about how you go about organizing Medicare 100 plus programs, negotiating with the hospitals, how you promote them, what the agreement should look like. So that was in 84, 85, I think, when we set that up with Burnham Hospital. Um, it later, Burnham started going out of business. Though, no, it was the city pushed a merger of Burnham with uh, Mercy Hospital, which led to this huge battle about will it be continued. We won that battle, so the city and the agreement agreed that the new facility uh, would accept and honor the Medicare Plus uh, program. So when Provena was created out of the merger between Mercy and Burnham, Covenant, yeah, that's right, it was Covenant back then. Um, they agreed that they would honor the program and they did it for a number of years. Then Provena started having a thing and so in the mid to late 90s they were like, we're going to end this program. And So you were around for all that, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And so that, I'll let you some other point tell about that whole battle. But it came out of the senior uh, Medicare task force. There was this other whole thing, early releases. So, in the, so the seniors got involved, we negotiated Medicare 100 plus. Example, right around, I don't want to say it was 86 to 88, DRGs came into place, diagnostic related groups. I can't believe how much I know about healthcare. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I have no background in this stuff at all. But this is where, so, you know, it used to be cost plus. You know, the hospitals, you know, do that. Well, so under Reagan and figuring out how we're going to hold down healthcare costs, they came with DRGs. And that is, okay, if you have gallbladder surgery, you should get this much money. And if you have open heart surgery, you should get this much money if you have this. And, you know, no matter how long that patient's in the hospital, this is how much money you get. That's what it costs in your area to do that we're going to give you that amount. So now the incentives for hospitals used to be keep the patients as long as you want, you know, because the more, the longer, got empty beds, keep that senior here for an extra week because that gives us that reimbursement from the federal government later on. Now, hey, that senior, we're getting a thousand bucks. Doesn't matter if they're here today or tomorrow, send them out. So suddenly there was this whole issue in the late 80s of early releases where suddenly seniors, and we started getting calls on the hotline, but hearing from our seniors, my husband's being sent home, I don't have any care. He was just, last year when this happened to so-and-so, they were in the hospital for a week and he's coming home after a day, oh my God. And we started hearing about all these complaints about people being released home. So, and it was, you know, so we started organizing around it here. There was actually a whole national set of uh, public hearings about it, uh, about how this DRG, so hospitals had to start informing seniors that they don't have to go, that they could be told this, but they have a right to appeal. Family member, they got a day to hear. They can't be sent home until. I mean, they were literally sending people home with no care at the other end, uh, and um, just dropping them off at their house uh, to have someone take care of them. So that was that was another fight that came out of the senior stuff. Um, you know, when HMOs came along. 
you know, for years, HMOs were like a consumer reform. And the, up in the yeah. Seattle, there was an HMO, I forget what it was called. Uh, but that was where consumers were going to pool together, huh? Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente, yeah, but there was also one up in Seattle. Yeah, Kaiser was a good one, and there was one up in Seattle, the Puget Sound HMO, yeah. I think it was, right? Um, there were the great reforms, you know, we're going to encourage people to be healthy and not pay doctors for when you're sick because there's sick care and if you're sick the doctor makes more money, so what incentive does he have to keep you healthy? Well, gee, health maintenance organizations will say here to the doctor, here's your $6,000, keep them healthy. So then the doctor's going to do all the cheap stuff, the early stuff, you know, do all that. Um, so we always loved HMOs. Well, it was getting enacted as a way to hold down healthcare costs at the end of the Reagan era, beginning of the Bush era. And uh, of course it gets distorted in that decision making process about how HMOs work. HMOs set up with this great model, but then the HMOs realize, well actually, we got the money now and we can make profit two ways. One is keep all these people healthy, which is really a difficult thing to do because you can't just keep people healthy. I mean, you will have these things. Or, you know, we can make it really hard for them to get into the system. Because if they can't get the health care, that'll also save us a lot of money because we got all the money up front. So hospitals and doctors and HMOs, suddenly, you know, the doctors and the HMOs are negotiating with the providers. Suddenly, all the providers own their own HMO. So, you know, Carl starts their HMO, Christie starts their HMO, and they start setting these barriers. And so they say, oh, well, you know, we need to have uh, people, now that we have these HMOs, they're just totally overutilizing the doctor. They're walking in no matter what they want to see a doctor because there's no barrier to care, and that's really bad. What we need to do is give them a disincentive, so we're going to start a $10 copayment. So that means if you're going to see your doctor, you've got to pay $10. I think it's $15 now, right? And then that'll discourage consumers from coming to see their doctor, and that's what we really need. So we did these series of studies that were incredibly impressive. I don't know, there was a series of three studies, and so, but there was a big outroar in the community. I mean, people were like, what do you mean we got to pay $10 every time you see the doctor? That's sort of, you know. So there was a lot of unhappiness around it. And we did a series of studies that was just very impressive about how uh, it was looking at length of stay in the hospitals was dropping. The number of visits to doctors was actually dropping under HMOs. This is before they did all this. I mean, it was all this stuff. And they just imposed this. And it was just another source of revenue. It had nothing to do with decreases and trying to keep people out. I wish I had those. I can't really remember the data, but it was some of the most impressive stuff. Yeah, Jason Gascoigne and Kevin were very involved in collecting this stuff from the Illinois Department of Insurance and just analyzing the data. I mean, it was, they were so blatantly making up what was going on. It was one of those things that was like, my God, so that's how that works. You just say it, and you say it enough times, and the media picks it up. Oh, they say it. It must be true. And then you look at the data, and it was nothing like that. So we started to organize eight around HMO. So now we're sort of organizing the middle class again, which is kind of sort of full circle. Now the middle class is being squeezed by health care. People hate their HMOs. They're being denied coverage by the HMOs. You know, what's the hearing? Well, the HMO has a secret hearing. Oh, we sorry, we decided it. Well, I'm, can I come to that? Well, no, it, it happened. You lost. You know, and so there was all these fights, and then it spit over to Congress again where there should be a set of consumer rights, and you should have a right to appeal, and you should have an opportunity for hearing. None of that was happening early on in the process. So there's that whole sort of, I, that was a time... <laughs> Because I remember in 92, Bill Clinton had just gotten elected, so we were just having this HMO thing. And it, it was clear that the medical care system, which for our first 15 or 20 years, there was a lot of issues around low-income people or other stuff. And it was like, wow, the middle class is not worried about who's on the HSA. Yeah. They're worried about their health care, the cost of it, having access, being denied care. And I remember this famous quote that I gave to the News Gazette. Um, no, it had to come. I don't know. No, it was when Clinton first got elected. It was. And they were saying, well, what do you think of the new administration? And I said, well, there's one thing that's clear is we'll have national health care before the end of the, <laughs> the decade and the century. Well, so I, so I don't, but I should put that up on my wall to remind me what a great prog <laughs> prognosticator I am. But it seems so obvious at the time. We can't continue to afford this. The system will fall apart. Poor people now. The middle class, it's out. Oh, it'll change. Um, not so fast, young guy. <laughs> it, it continues to fall apart. It continues to fall apart, yeah. Um, so there were those kinds of issues going on. I'm trying to see if there were other stuff that... Uh, oh, Delta Dental? God. Delta Dental, but there was also the Christie Medicare. Oh, Christie, yeah, with Amani. Um, so... 
Yeah, so that yeah, so that was around 88, 89. That was right before the HMO stuff, which was probably more like 91, 92. And Delta Dental was right around that point in time. On the Christie stuff, you know, and it has, there was this whole thread that came out of Hill Burton thing. So, you know, free and low cost care was part of Hill Burton. But then there was this other thing called the community service obligation in which hospitals, when they took that federal Hill Burton money in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, they said, oh yeah, we'll give a reasonable amount of free and low cost care. The other thing they said is we're not going to discriminate against our patients. And what does that mean? Well, the rules end up saying it means you have to take Medicare and Medicaid patients when they show up at your door. You can't discriminate against them. And it was actually um, the folks at the Cape Cod Coalition uh, started documenting um, where doctors, the hospital would say, well, we'll take anyone. You know, we don't discriminate. But uh, the doctors on the staff, like uh, the Cape Cod group, none of the eye doctors who do eye surgery would take Medicaid recipients. So they had cases of people on Medicaid who needed surgery. It was a hospital in their community. They couldn't get the surgery because none of the doctors would take Medicaid patients. So the rules under the Carter administration came out and they said, well, the hospital not only has to have a policy, but what they have to have is every specialty and subspecialty at the hospital has to ensure that the doctors see Medicaid recipients. Now, you, you have the authority in your physician privileges. A doctor can't just practice at the hospital. You have to give them privileges. You have to have a degree. You have to have all these various things that you have. One of the requirements can be, and you have to take Medicaid and Medicare patients. No questions asked. So you can impose it any time if you want. But if you don't want to go that far, at least what you have to do is say that every specialty and subspecialty, there's a plan where Medicaid recipients get in. So if none of them always take it, then you have to say Dr. Smith takes the next one, and then Dr. Jones, and then Dr. Smith again, and Dr. Jones. You have to have some plan so that if a Medicaid recipient wants to use your facility, there's some doctor in every special and subset who will take it. Well, of course, the hospitals really didn't do that. And then we have places like Carl who have these huge clinics in the hospital. And so what we started to do was to start linking their certain departments in the house, in the clinic who weren't taking any Medicaid recipients. And it worked at Carl, we were working on this issue, and then at Christie. And Christie was starting to get really bad about it. And, you know, and sometimes it's a change of administration, but they just started like, you know, Medicaid payments from the state are going down. Oh, we can't afford to do this. We're just going to cut them off. So they just had this policy where, you know, we're not taking any Medicaid, new Medicaid patients. And there was a woman who's on the inside of one of our newsletters, so maybe on the cover. Um, she was you know, pregnant, it's like eight months pregnant. I can't think, she had brown, blonde hair, I can't think of her name right now. And uh, her husband lost her job, family went on Medicaid, she called to go for her next prenatal care. Christy said, sorry, you're on Medicaid, you can't come here anymore. She's eight months pregnant. She's been going this doctor all the time. Sorry, we don't take any Medicaid patients, new Medicaid patients. And you're a new Medicaid patient. I mean, you may be an old patient of ours, but you're a new Medicaid patient, we won't take you. And they were doing stuff like this. It was just unbelievable. So, you know, we had a news conference. We were up here by then because the news conference was right on the other side of this wall. And I just remember this woman telling the story and the media picking up on it. And it was, you know, people were just outraged. Come on. You know, here are these doctors. I mean, they're not hurting. They're really not that bad off. We understand they have a business, but you're going to tell this woman after eight months that now she can't come back because she had to go on Medicaid. So there's this big push. Um, and again, with a lot of our stuff, it was not just what's the rule. Well, the rule is they can do it at Christie Clinic because the hospital uh, had independent doctors, right? So there were the troopins, and they would take Medicaid patients. And Christie Clinic would say, well, if they're taking them, we'll just deny them at our clinic. And so the hospital couldn't be used as leverage point anymore because the hospital, you could get in there if you could get in into the other doctor's office, but it was a way you like the doctor you're going to. So we tried a different approach. Um, Amani Bazell was our, uh, I don't know if she was the board chair at that point, she might have been, but she got very involved in the organization at this point. And so that's the march there where we marched to the community, um, trying to put pressure on Christie Clinic to change their policy on this. And again, it was really getting a lot of attention in the community. And we tried this new angle where there was non-discrimination laws at the city. And so we tried to argue that the um, you couldn't discriminate it against anyone based on their source of income. And it was when people were renting, uh, oftentimes you couldn't say you can't do it if you have a voucher kind of stuff. And we said, well, that this is a source of income for a poor person. And we think that the city should say, Christie Clinic, you can't discriminate based on this. You can't have you know, future changes for your expansion and stuff like that. Um, and so there was a big battle going on getting the city to do that. The city never, the Human Rights Commission, unfortunately, never quite voted to do it. And there were some good people on there, but it's amazing. I mean, it's a good example where when there's heat and pressure on you, people who know it's the right thing to do just can't bring themselves to do it. I mean, it, it is tough. Um, but 
with this stuff going on, and, and Bob Thompson was the uh, executive director over at Christie Clinic, and that march ended right in Christie's parking lot, and there was a huge group of people there, and Mr. Thompson was up there, and he agreed to sit down and negotiate. Amani was great. I mean, she wouldn't let anyone off the hook, and you know, she had the set of demands, and we're going to meet with you, and he said, well, we'll sit down and negotiate, and we'll change our policies, and do all this stuff. So we actually went into negotiations with Christie to do that, and again, it was sort of like the Hilburton thing. You would just look at, there's a chart, and again, I don't know if it's on that one, or little pressure leads to changes at clinic, yeah. There's this chart about how many Medicaid patients they were taking, and then how many they started to when they started changing the policies. I mean, it literally went from a couple hundred to, I think, over a thousand uh, Medicaid patients. In So it was, again, you know, the whole time they're always saying, on Hill Burton, on this, we didn't change it because of the healthcare consumers. We just decided that this is, this is we're just a good facility. And so, I mean, they always deny that they do any of this because of any of the stuff going on in the community. They do it because they're committed. And so that's sort of an inevitable battle. What we always have to look at is, what was it like before we started doing this? What's it like now that we're doing this? You know, how has it changed? They can say whatever they want. That's their sense of reality. Our thing is, are things better off for people now than they were uh, when we started doing this? So um, so there, there was that. That was a, that was a big, huge thing. Uh, and it also, before that one, there was a similar battle in uh, 86, I think, at Carl. And that's when we had the referendum um, where Carl was doing this stuff. And they had agreed to, you know, there's always these stupid ass rules where um, Carl's service area, they couldn't, they had to take Medicaid patients. Well, their service area, of course, was from 1960. It was Champaign County and parts of Ford and uh, Douglas County. And they now have clinics in Danville and Bloomington Normal. I mean, they're bringing in patients everywhere. Yeah. And so what's happening is they go over, open up a clinic in Danville, and then they would take all the paying patients over in Danville, refer them over to Carl to have their surgery and all the expensive stuff done, and say, oh, you're not in our main service area. See, the federal government document says you're not in our service area. We don't have to take the Medicaid patients. So for the doctors in Danville, it's like all of our paying patients are being sucked out of our community going over to Carl because they put this little clinic here. And then we're being stuck with all the Medicaid patients, and it's destroying our, you know, medical facilities, it's destroying our physicians, and financially, it's really unfair. Um, and so um, there was a whole issue that we were fighting. So because they could legally get around having their service area being smaller, we went to the city of Urbana and wanted them to have a, a law saying that if you discriminate based on this stuff, and we took the stuff from Hilburton, that you couldn't get any approval. And Carl was always looking for approval for stuff. So we put this referendum on the ballot uh, in 86, asking the citizens, do you think you should have this thing where the city doesn't help any medical facility to discriminate? And it passed, like, with two-thirds of the vote, uh, voting for it. It was real big. And so, and then Carl, oh, we're going to change how we're doing this stuff. So that had happened before the Christie stuff. Um, and we used a slightly different tactic than Christie with the human rights ordinance there. Um, there was also, around this time, Delta Dental, so our hotline was being bombarded with dental calls, so this is still an issue in this community. Um, but back then, we were getting all these calls, so we, were, we went after the local dentist to pressure them to take Medicaid recipients. Um, and, you know, when we were doing this with the doctors, we were, you know, we kept that Christmas caroling thing alive for a while. So we would do it, uh, I remember doing it at Champagne Country Club, yeah. Christmas caroling. Um, but the uh, doctors, or the dentist said to us... This actually has a picture of Mamie and everybody on his Facebook page singing at the Country Club. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Song. yeah we, they had their big dinner and we were outside at Christmas time. And, you know, <laughs> and then they actually marched and went into the... Um, the country club thing during the dinner is a little audacious. Um, but so this was a problem. And so the dentists were um, complaining. So, you know, it's really a pain. There's this thing, Delta Dental, and it really sucks. It's full reimbursement. And I remember I spoke at a, uh, uh, what's one of those civic clubs, the Rotary of Champagne or something like that, out here on the Holiday Inn when it was, used to be on Neal Street. And uh, a dentist came up to me afterwards. Um, Anderson, Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson. He said, you know, Mike, you used to make a lot of good points, and I agree with him, but you have to understand from our point of view, there's some really bad things here. And I'm willing, though, to take a certain number of patients. I don't even want Medicaid, but I will take a certain number of patients, and I will help get the other dentists, because I mean, we should be doing this. We're, you know, we're not evil people. We can be doing more. We should be doing more. But you also have to understand our point of view on how this stuff is. I mean, we're not just people who are mean and evil. Uh, it is hard running our businesses, and the state's program really sucks. And so, out of his offer, we said, you know, well, tell us, what are the problems you're having with the state stuff? And so we did this analysis of the um, state's contract with Delta Dental. 
And it, I don't even remember some of the stuff, but it was, it was scandalous what was going on. They were getting all this money and they were paying none of it out. I mean, the state was giving us like a $21 million contract for dental care and almost none of it was being paid out. I mean, they were just denying everything. And uh, we did this really nice report and study. And I, I think Lou Petrchek was uh, around back then, did, did the work on that. Um, and uh, it was so big that the Sun-Times, we pitched it. We said, we got this story, and we just think this is scandalous what the state's doing. And so there was a report at Sun-Times says, let me see, and he saw it, and he says, this is front page. This is, we're gonna go with this. The editors love this. It'll be the front page of the Chicago Sun-Times. And um, the day that we were releasing it with them is when, <laughs> funny how you remember these things, Dan Rather asked some mean question of George Bush this is leading up to the 92 presidential election. And Bush sort of knew it was coming at this thing and shot back at him. And the headline was, you know, Bushwhacked. Um. And it kicked our story off. Oh, no. <laughs> and it was, either, it was either the next day or it was lower on down that day, you know, state contract with Delta Dental question or something like that. It was a great story. It was a very good story. But we went from having the front page thing because of the George Bush and the Dan Rather's uh, oh, little no. uh, snippet thing. So I always remember that. You can't control everything. You can't control everything. <laughs> it's such a good story. But anyway, so that led to this whole expose about mm -hmm. Delta Dental and the change changing of the state contract. You know, so we said to the dentist, look, we're really... We heard you. We're out here. We're, you know, we, it's, we don't care who we criticize and what we have to do. We just want to get people care. So if that's the problem, we're doing our part. We're trying to focus on that. We're trying to clean up that program. But we really need you to do this. And, and Dr. Anderson was pretty good. And I know they, that's when we started the dental referral program around that time. We just get some people in to see a dentist in an emergency case. And it was really triage. Um, there was also some stuff going on at Francis Nelson because I remember... Yeah, that was being closed down. And so it, what would happen is, you know, and this is one of the things that says that we don't tell people about it because we'll use up all the free care now. It's like, well, you know what? Never hold back on showing what the real need is. Right. Because that's the only time people say, oh my God, it's that bad? Well, let's do something as a community. So this idea of, well, we don't want to overload the system is no. If, if the need's there, let it happen. So unfortunately at that time, Francis Nelson had dental care and they had too many uh, patients for that. But what they did was always made it harder and harder to get in so that they could keep it down. There's too many of you out there. We can't control you. So the way you had to do it, you had to show up and stand in line on Tuesdays and Thursdays morning. And people were getting out there at 5 in the morning to stand in line. There'd be 30 people to get in to see the dentist. And it's like, you've got to be kidding me. So we had a news conference right in front of the line like at 8 in the morning and there were 15 people standing in line and just saying, this is what dental care is like in our community. This is a place they can go and they have to stand here all night to get in line to see a dentist. So, um, so that's been a long-standing issue that it continues to be a tough one to actually crack the nut of. And, and, and actually, know. when you hear about Francis Nelson and what they were doing, then it should remind you of uh, Champaign-Urbana Public Health District and how they do. You know, yeah. Instead of figuring out what it is that they can do to meet the need, they figure out what it is that they can do to make themselves more comfortable you know, given the overwhelming need and, right. and, you know, and then it's the people who need the care, you know, that, that are it. burdened, you right. know, right. in that way. Yeah. yeah, and Francis Nelson ended up um, getting rid of their dental clinic yeah, just did. at the time, actually, when the federal government started really paying nicely for, for people who used to have dental clinics. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Francis Nelson, you know, um, had some very hard times, uh, and eventually, I mean, I remember there's this whole thing about where they're going to survive, and I think that's when the Decatur group came and take it over. Um, so there's that stuff. You know, another one that came along, and this is, I think, when Claudia got involved by 96, we're talking about now, is um, the public health department. So when I came, you know, when healthcare consumers were first getting started in 1977, people like the League of Women Voters would come and they say, you know what we ought to do? We ought to get a countywide health department. We lost that referendum in 1976 and we ought to go back and do that. So that I had heard about this since 1977. <laughs> we ought to go do that. We ought to... And I don't know where the hell it came from in 96, but it started coming up again. I think it was the dental stuff. Yeah. And there was, so there's just Champaign-Urbana. So suddenly, you know, it's like, well, none of the people who live outside of Champaign-Urbana don't even qualify to get to the dental clinic and there's all this need and it's time to go back and have the referendum. Um, 
And so healthcare consumers, you know, so it was 20 years later uh, for, with lost and so the countywide health referendum lost in 1976, year before healthcare consumers started. So in 94, 95, Nancy Greenwald would have been executive director. And, um, you know, and Imani, who was a leader and led that march, was executive director in the uh, early 90s. I think she started in 92. Um, and Nancy was, um, helped lead the charge on the public health thing. It was a great campaign that, you know, I mean, they were doing polling and focus groups and um, then just ran this great campaign to, to pass the referendum here. And so in 1996, it passed and for the first time in you know, forever, there was a countywide health department to cover service and provide services that hadn't been available prior to that. Um, can, you, can you talk real quick about um, what your time was at Healthcare Consumers and your different roles oh, when sure. you were executive director? Yeah. So, um, so 77 we started and I was just, like everyone else, just a volunteer. But I was young and I graduated around seven. I was working part time at Francis Nelson. So through this, um, so the healthcare consumers, one of the people who, you know, we had invited in to tell us about health care issues in the community was Tom Brown, who was executive director of uh, Francis Nelson at that time. So uh, through when we started healthcare consumers, you know, Tom had come to some of the initial meetings and he was mentioning need to have some help doing some research. So he hired me as a student intern. I worked at Francis Nelson for a couple of years there, real part time. And in 79, we got the grant from the Citizen Participation Grant, was what it was called, uh, from um, through the Community Services Administration. It was a one-year, one-time grant of $25,000. So I got hired as executive director in 1977 um, on three-quarters time. And I was in that position, executive director, although unemployed executive director for part of it, um, until around 83, 80, 82, 83, somewhere there. So only about three or four years. Then I went on the board, and Cynthia Ward, who had been a VISTA volunteer, was hired as a, an executive director. That was a time when there was a lot of, uh, there was another time when the organization was a bit challenged because um, when I was stepping down, there were some people in the group who wanted to hire, um, to do a national search and you know, we're doing pretty well, we should hire someone from the outside. And that tended to be the people who were involved in the HSA stuff who had worked closely with me. I would say sort of faculty folks at the university. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were um, people in the community who had worked with Cynthia as a VISTA volunteer, knew her, trusted her, people like Mamie, Louise White. Uh, and they really wanted to have Cynthia. Why would we do a search? We've got Cynthia right here. And so there was a big fight over. And, and a couple of the people from the university were leaving uh, town. Um, and so it was like, you know, and I feel bad about this because it caused a real split uh, and some bad feelings. Again, probably didn't handle it well as a young person. But where uh, there was a split about what should we do. And, um, it seemed a little, and, the, and the, the highly educated people, people who had PhDs or you know, graduate degrees, were very articulate and could, you know, they felt like they knew a lot and they did, but there was a certain sense of, well, we know what's best for the organization. And, you know, Mamie's a wonderful person, but I'm a professor. <laughs> And I know better, and we should do a search because Cynthia's young and she might not be able to do it. And um, so my loyalties were very torn, and there was an effort to go this way. And I found myself going the other way. And, you know, so there's two groups in the organization that were sort of organizing the outcome. And in the end, uh, there was an unfortunate meeting, names being said, and um, five people got up and left the organization and have never come back. Um, as a result of that decision to hire Cynthia um, and not to go through a search process. A couple of them, um, one who was Barry Checkaway, who was there at the very beginning, he was leaving the community. He was taking a job at the University of Michigan um, and was leaving. And it just felt like, you know, you're not going to be here, so you should say it's your organization. And, but, you know, it probably wasn't that simple and straightforward. But it caused real bad feelings and... Um, so that was one time where the group almost split up uh, because some people walked off. And it was the core of the organization at the time in terms of that. So, so then I, uh, Cynthia was executive director, and then she left around 85, 86. Um, and then I came back as executive director until 92 when I left again. I was always a little bit antsy. Um, and Amani Bazal took over. Um, and then Imani was here, and then um, 
Amani was followed by Nancy. So then I was pretty much on the board, although I did somewhere in between the Amani and Nancy transition, uh, I came back for a while and was executive for a period of there. So I was executive director like two or three times, um, you know, for short periods. In between, I was often on the board when I was an executive director. Um, and then when you became executive director, you know, one of the things that's a little bit both reassuring and makes me feel really good is that I was able to at some point disconnect myself from healthcare consumers. And, you know, part of it's just, I think, founder syndrome where you feel like, oh, well, how can they do this without me? Um, and that's never a good thing to feel. But it's not so much that as you want it to succeed, but you bring a lot of history and experience to it. So I always felt like I wanted to not be there and know that the organization, so it's always been very reassuring to me for the last eight years where I don't think I've been that involved um, and the organization has flourished and done well and so that's very reassuring. Well, when, uh, when I became, when I was hired on staff and then I became director, Mike was on the board and then probably a, about a year after being director you wanted to step off the board and I think I begged you to stay um, <laughs> because Mike taught me how to do budgeting and all kinds of stuff. But we had some really major um, political or major you know struggles going on um, one which we'll talk about later but just to show some of them because um, they continue today in a different incarnation but around 1999 which is when I became the director um, we had this big struggle around like community benefits and uh -huh. Carl Hospital and Provena and they weren't giving financial assistance but we were learning about how cash rich they were and Carl Hospital and Carl Clinic were maybe going to merge and, and, and Carl Clinic was going to become nonprofit, but every Carl, the Carl system was saying, but don't worry, nothing's going to change. And we were like, wait a minute, something better damn well change. If Carl Clinic goes nonprofit, <laughs> something damn well better change, you know. So we started this whole um, right. fair share campaign around it and yeah. uh, Mike was very involved in that and then um, we were about to order the yard signs and then all of a sudden we found out that the merger fell through it wasn't going to happen but then we started focusing you know on hospitals on community benefits and stuff but that was also the time when Provena or Covenant had changed ownership and became part of Provena and then the Medicare 100 plus program was yeah. ended and that was a huge struggle Mike was very involved with that and Maybe before we wrap up, if you can just talk a little bit about one piece of that. Um, when we were trying to, because uh, because you and I were in this together, we went to Chicago together, but um, <laughs> we were trying to, what happened, I'll tell you all more later, but what happened was basically Pravina was saying, hey, the feds are making us kill this community program. The feds are telling us that this program is illegal and we can't do it. Don't blame us, blame the feds. And we actually started to try to get information about, you know, we said, okay, we'll go to the feds and ask them, you know, to talk to us and why are you killing this program? And then the feds um, got annoyed, Pravina got annoyed, and all of a sudden the Illinois Attorney General's office got sicked on us. And um, do you want to, do you remember? Yeah, well, they, they were charging us with uh, violating consumer laws because we were promoting this program that either was illegal, they were saying it's an illegal program and you're out there promoting it, so we're investigating you. This is under our Republican Attorney General, Ryan. Uh, we're investigating you for violating consumer fraud uh, protection acts to healthcare consumers because you're promoting this program that we think is illegal. And, and so we went, uh, you and I and Bob Kirshner went up to meet with the Attorney General staff. Yeah. Hold on one sec, Mike. Bouncy. Right, there was something going on where, yeah, and because the, Ryan was somehow connected to Provena, right? Yeah. The Attorney General had some Provena what connection. What had happened, he found out about, so we went up to Chicago, and, and I think, you know, Bob had found out that um, the head of Provena had actually sat down, had an in-person meeting with the Attorney General's um, assistant attorney um, who filed this motion and basically came and had a meeting with her and said you need to investigate them and the whole notion was that like the Attorney General's office doesn't do the bidding of corporations and investigate you know consumers and residents of the state just on behalf of a corporation it was essentially harassment in the attorney so anyway Bob knew about this like you know, conspiracy that they didn't know that we knew about. So we go up to Chicago. 
I, well, I remember the meeting, and it got pretty weird and intense. But, it, <laughs> but in the end, they said, you're right, we're wrong, we'll drop the whole case, if I remember it correctly. Yeah. 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 Basically, at some point during the meeting, they're asking us questions. We're going through the documents and all this. And then finally, Bob just lets it fly. He said, you know, he said in his Bob way, so on this date at this time, you, attorney, you know, asshole, met with, you know, so-and-so and all that. And then you could just see the look on their faces. It was like, sort of like, it's up. Yeah. It's done. Jigs up, man. Like, we, we know what you, but he let them take us through all this stuff where I'm showing them documents, you know, and all this stuff. And then, and then it was done. But it was, when Mike was talking about earlier, be careful who you go up, who you go after, because they will use ways to come after you. Yeah, that's And that true. was a very heavy-handed way. And actually, the Attorney General's office, if they investigate you, even if they find that you've done nothing wrong, they, and I don't know if this is still true, but they can charge you money for their investigation of you. Mm -hmm. And so this could have killed Champaign County health care mm -hmm. consumers financially. So this was a really heavy-handed mm -hmm. tactic. Yeah. Yeah. And then I don't know if there were other things after that that you were... Yeah. I mean, I always seek you out for advice and stuff. Right. Um, well, I, there was a lot of was around that whole medic. I guess the two things of my involvement at the end was the uh, Carl Community Benefit stuff, mm -hmm. because the fear was if the clinic goes nonprofit, then they won't pay taxes. So that raised a lot of concern among the government, the school district, and the city. It was like, oh my God, we don't want you to become nonprofit because if you become nonprofit, then you won't pay taxes to us. And the community was like, well, that could be pretty cool because if all those millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars become nonprofit, they have an obligation as a nonprofit to provide free and low-cost services and do other kinds of things in the community because they're going to get tax exempt status. So it could really benefit people if this huge for-profit thing now has become nonprofit. What are the benefits we're going to get? And I'm convinced that Carl much preferred to not pay the taxes and do that. But when the community responded saying, well, then you have all these other obligations, it was like, well, that takes away the whole advantage right. of becoming this thing. We were doing it to not pay taxes. Now we're going to have to pay more in benefits than actually taxes. Right. And so they dropped the, the thing on it. Yeah. It was actually a really tense time because we were trying to form this fair, uh, fair share coalition where the schools would be on our side, even though the schools, as Mike said, it basically felt like they would lose a ton of money. And so we had actually, that's actually when we started researching Mayo Clinic, okay, because Carl always compares themselves to Mayo. Oh, we're the Mayo of, you know, the Champaign County, or East Central Illinois. It's the furthest thing from the truth. We found out that Mayo Clinic is nonprofit, but they pay, they make uh, payment in lieu of tax. In lieu of taxes, because they recognize that by not paying property taxes, they're depriving you know the schools and the city and all that of property tax revenue. So they voluntarily make payments in lieu of taxes. Plus, they offer financial assistance. Plus, you know they really invest in local education because they realize that their employees, you know, of tomorrow are the children of today going to the school system locally. So it's really don't ever believe that Carl is anything like Mayo at all. You know. Right. So well, I think that's one of the common things is that people, you know, it always amazes me that institutions will say stuff and they, you know, you can't take it for face value. You always have to verify it and find out what's true. And to me, where that really happened the first time was the HMO stuff when they would just say this stuff. We assumed that they were right, that they had high, you know, that the utilization, that people were coming in and they were overutilizing the doctor's office. And we assumed that was all right. We just wanted to document, well, how much money are they going to get? And is that really the thing? And is this really working? And then when we found out that all that was made up, that all of their utilization rates, their visits to doctors per year had dropped, the hospital stays had dropped, all this stuff was dropping. It was like, what do you mean? What do you, what's the justification for this stuff? Mm -hmm. So, can, can you talk a little bit about maybe just, um, I know you were, probably weren't prepared to do this, but thinking of some of, the, some of the lessons learned or some of the things that repeat over and over again that you keep seeing, you know, that you saw that we still see, you know, like the stuff about that, like, I mean, just a variety of things, like healthcare providers can say whatever they want, but we can never be wrong on the facts, you know, um, right. and all that. And then also just about how it is a common tactic to criticize, you know, an organization about their tactics or strategy and, 
you know, to deflect from the real issues yeah. at hand. Yes, I think that, you know, and I think, well, one thing is, to me, that's, I remember seeing this story on um, 60 Minutes, and it was in, it was during the Reagan years, um, and the economy was really tanking at the time, and, you know, a lot of the industrial uh, Midwest was hurting, the Rust Belt, and this was about an organization that was in, uh, I think it was Pittsburgh, it was Western Pennsylvania, and the 60 Minutes was doing a story about the communities organizing against corporate people or something, and in some ways, I, you know, I always remember talking about it because it was such a, it's not too often that they talk about community organizing on 60 Minutes or anywhere else. And it was so disappointing to see the story, and I was never sure, God, is the, did they pick the wrong organization and the wrong organizing, or they do a disservice to what it was. But they totally focused on the tactics of the group in Western Pennsylvania, which is unemployed workers who were fighting back corporations who were laying off people and stuff like that. And one of the tactics was this one organization was that they threw red dye water or red paint on some corporate guy and said, the blood of the community is on your hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was this thing, and you know, um, that's what 60 Minutes was really focusing on. And you know, unfortunately, the organizer said this thing, and maybe it was the organizer, but he said, you know, he's causing all this pain for people in the community, and we want to know what it's like to feel humiliated and to feel that way. And so that's why we did it. And it's like, really? I mean, tactics should never be for the purpose of tactics. You know, it's not like punishing people. There's really nothing that it always should be got. Well, how does this get us closer to making people's lives better? I mean, that's what it should be about. And so, and I think the general view of community organizing and of protest organizing is, oh, they go out and they protest. Because that's what the TV like. The TV loves conflicts. They love signs. They like posters. Oh, the people are angry, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But it's really, those are always just means to get to where you want to go. It should never be about that. I mean, that isn't why we do this. Is so some guy feels humiliated. My God, if you want him to save jobs, then he should be saving jobs. He shouldn't be humiliated. So I think one of the real lessons that it's always hard is people get caught up in the tactics. And the other side always focuses on the tactics, and the media always love the tactics. And for us, it's always that thing where I was saying before, what existed before we were organizing, what exists after we were organizing, and what we have to always judge ourselves on. If that's not getting better, then we're not doing something right. That if that's the same thing exists now, it does now, but we've humiliated a few people, yeah. you know, that's really not organizing. That's just humiliating people. And maybe you feel good about it, but it doesn't really, that's not what we should be doing with our time. It should be really about making changes that are really concrete and that people can say that. Because that's also why people get involved. I mean, so there's a sort of thing, you know, that people, you know, part of organizing, there's this thing, in, you know, from Midwest Academy and uh, Saul Lansky that, you know, you want to give people a sense of their own power, so that partly means the tactics you choose to involve lots of people so that they can do it, so when there is change, they feel part of it, so you don't want to just hire some lawyer who goes off and does something, and so then when you win, or if not, People say, oh, I couldn't do anything about it. I had to be a lawyer, so I had to go hire. I mean, I've seen I've many groups in this community. There was one around utility rate increases when Illinois Power was building the power plant and people were organizing. They had this huge rally over at the Ramada Inn. There had to be 500 people there. People were really pissed about their utility bills. And what they voted to do was to raise money, $10,000, and they hired a law firm for retainer. Uh-huh. And then everyone went home. And I don't have to do anything because we raised $10,000, and we have a lawyer who's going to go and through the rate case at the thing, and uh-huh. that group never left. And I always remember talking to people and they said, no, you know, the lawyer got really complicated and we had nothing to do. We were just waiting for it. And it goes on for months and sometimes goes on for years. Um, So one of the things is that you do want to give people a sense of their own power, right? I mean, because that's what people uh, get involved in it because they do it. But then you also, the second principle is always making real change in people's lives so that people see it because that's why they keep coming back. That's why they bring other people in is because, hey, it made a difference. They used to discriminate against us. Now they don't. This policy used to be there, now it isn't. So those real concrete improvements, that's why people uh, get involved uh, and get others involved. And then the last one is altering the relationships of power so that the hospitals and the doctors or, you know, if it's the utility companies, they recognize that how we behave, you know, institutions operate in an environment and their thing is growth and stability. You know, you can't grow unless things are stable, so they're always, they're always responsive to their environment. Oh, we have these zoning thing changes, well that's going to hurt us here. So they're looking for stability. So part of our role in going out there and protesting is like, oh my God, healthcare consumers complaining about something. What are they complaining about? Well, we're doing something wrong. We'll fix that because we want stability, quiet, we're okay, we're good, everything's all right, we're moving forward with our plans. So part of our thing is popping up and saying, hey, over here, pay attention, 
this is a problem, drawing attention to it, giving people that. But over time, I mean, that's what's the beauty of the healthcare consumers. It doesn't always happen, but there's an organization there that's now 32 years around. And when, believe me, when the health, when the healthcare providers or people are thinking about what we should be doing, they're thinking, well. What's the healthcare consumers going to do? Right. What's the community's response going to be? So they're altering their behavior even before they roll something out. They're thinking about that and they're altering the relationship of power so that you not, you know, we're fortunate to live in a country where there is this um, opportunity to influence stuff, but where there is, um, what's the word I want to use? I can't think of it. Um, where there's different sets of interests. Uh, and that we, one of the responsibilities we have in altering the relationship of power is building a base in the community that's ongoing that gives a voice to people who otherwise don't have a voice in it. And that changes behaviors even before bad things happen. I mean, you still have to be there when bad things happen to make them accountable and stuff like that. But so those are, I think, some of the lessons yeah. that we've learned. Like a perfect place to end. <laughs> <laughs> don't, kill don't kill me! Don't kill me! That's no. Wonderful. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I was just curious. The professor that uh, you did that class is he still around? Or? Barry Checkaway. The, the oh, that was the professor. Oh, so he was one who broke away. I was going to say what is so he? So sort of sad. So seventy-seven. He went to University of Michigan, eighty-two, and. Um, the last nine months he was in town, we didn't talk. I mean, this is a guy who was my mentor, you know, who, and you know, I called him right before he left, the week before I heard they were leaving. And he said, I, I still too raw, can't talk now. And, uh, you know, and yeah. you know, what can you do? I mean, I, it was probably, again, I was, I would say, I was so young, didn't really think through things, and so probably wasn't as good about doing it. And we, our paths did cross a, a few years later in a phone call over some foundation, um, but haven't had any real contact with them since then. You know, the thing that's, like, besi besides what you said, the other thing that's really sad about it, though, is that, like, you know, all those other healthcare consumer organizations folded and went away. And here we are 32 years later. And so obviously there was not a wrong decision made. Well, yes, I don't think, you know, I, I think it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Certainly at the time, it was the right message to yeah. send. I'm just saying it would be nice if he could see that. Yeah, well, and maybe he can. Yeah. This is being filmed. I don't want to, you know, I, it's I, clearly, I, I feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I, no, that's fine. I mean, I, I do feel bad about it, uh, you know, and Barry may be very cool. I actually, my son is involved in education education reform. He's a teacher at the Social Justice High School. And he ran across Barry's uh, thing. I, I think the most things that, that just from my time being here is that they seem to have no problem taking, event, taking credit mm -hmm. for things that is just not their work. And they can't, they, they can't organize like that. Remember there was that one day when they were having like this candidate forum or whatever and we found out like at the last mm -hmm. something's never changed I need a receipt from you <laughs> the international house in New Orleans $270.94 January 29th so, that, so Jeff that was on our uh, community shares credit card yes and you gave me the uh, airfare receipt yeah I don't think I had an email thing. So I'll probably get a call. Yeah, a, a lot of times you can just call them and then they'll um, back to the order. Um, we'll just wait for the audience. Well, I feel like one of the biggest lessons I, I feel like I take from this, I just feel like it's just amazing to me how. Exactly. Well, and actually, one of the one of the things that you did with us, you know, not so long ago, was when we kicked off uh, the healthcare access task force and we had that community meeting on healthcare access. You came and talked. Uh, I don't want to give him any money. About these, you know, Medicaid discrimination struggles in the past, and you sort of made this presentation where you said, like, you know, the only thing that ever changed anything was the community organizing. Mm -hmm. and so that's what we need to do now. Um, yeah, and you know, um, it's kind of like highways. Remember, someone once said to me, 